This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On November 23, 2016, Military History Night listened to an address by Canadian author and former director of the Churchill Society, Terry Reardon, on the topic Winston Churchill and Mackenzie King, so similar, so different. Good evening again. Thank you, Pat. As Pat said, the subtitle of the book makes two statements. So similar, so different. Most people acknowledge the so different. Churchill was fiery, impetuous, and charismatic, an extrovert. King was cool, calculating, and bland, an introvert. When matters had to be addressed, Churchill charged forward, whereas King considered all aspects and then passed them through his intuition before cautiously proceeding. <laughs> it's so similar, yes, besides their being born just 17 days apart in late 1874, there are other similarities. So none of their choosing, such as the height, five foot six inches, and the color of their eyes, blue. However, what they did both develop themselves was a high degree of self-confidence in their own opinions and decisions. They both had large egos. As Churchill said, we are all worms, but I believe that I am a glowworm. <laughs> and King, when he was elected leader of the Liberal Party in 1919, wrote that this was the work of God. <laughs> they both had the essential attribute for politicians, that of being accomplished actors. Churchill showed this in his speeches, which were carefully crafted to obtain the required reaction from the audience. King consciously portrayed himself in public as a serious, non-threatening statement, which he had determined would appeal to the Canadian public and especially to the Canadian voter. In modern parlance, King was his own spin doctor. Both were writers. Churchill was a prolific author. His books on the First and Second World Wars are standard works on the conflicts. King wrote just one full-length book, set for collections of his war speeches, but King kept a diary for 57 years, from the age of 18 until his death, age 75, with few days missing. This unique record totals almost 30,000 pages containing seven and a half million words. He intended to use the diary when writing his memoirs, and it is quite clear that he did not intend secret and sensitive matters especially during the Second World War, to be for public consumption. Time doesn't permit me now to go into the circumstances as to how and why his wishes were not carried out, but they are covered in the book. Churchill wrote his war books some years after the fact, and not surprisingly, he ensured that he was depicted in a positive light. Also, he had to sanitize his comments as some players in the war were still in prominent positions. The diary of Mackenzie King, however, was written at the time, and we know exactly what he was thinking, without the benefit of subsequent reassessment. King and Churchill met for the first time in December 1900, when they were both 26 years of age, and it was not a success. King found Churchill drinking champagne at 11 o'clock in the morning, and the rather priggish King was not impressed. In the interest of time, I'll skip the next 20 years, although that period saw so both have many highs and lows in their personal and political lives. In 1922, King, now Prime Minister, and Churchill, now Secretary of State for the Colonies, clashed. The matter was a strong request for Canada to pledge Canadian troops to a possible military action against the Turkish army. This blew over, but it emphasized to King that although he was a strong Anglophile, Canada could no longer continue in a subservient position. The British North America Act of 1867 had given Canada control over domestic affairs, but not foreign affairs. Thus, in 1914, when Britain declared war on Germany, Canada was automatically at war. King's efforts resulted in Britain enacting the Balfour Declaration of 1926 
and the Treaty of Westminster of 1931, whereby Canada now had control of her affairs, both domestic and foreign. Churchill was strongly against what he saw as the watering down of the British Empire into the British Commonwealth, but he had to accept defeat. But there was one area in which Churchill was superior to King, and that was in a sense of humor. A quote from a dialogue with the playwright George Bernard Shaw. Shaw, I'm reserving two tickets for you for the premiere of my St. Joan. Come and bring a friend if you have one. <laughs> Churchill, impossible to be present for the first performance, will attend the second if there is one. <laughs> Churchill's political career was in the ascendancy in the mid-1920s, with his occupying the prestigious position of Chancellor of the Exchequer for five years. However, in the general election held in 1929, his Conservative Party was defeated. Churchill took advantage of what he hoped would be just a lull in his political career at a high level, and he embarked on a tour of Canada and the United States. He was treated royally by the Canadian Pacific Railway, with a private rail car being placed at his disposal. He spoke in Toronto to the Empire Club at the recently opened Royal York Hotel, the largest hotel in the British Empire, with a packed audience and 3,000 people listening to his speech, relayed by loudspeakers placed outside the hotel. Churchill continued his journey across the country, and while staying, staying at the Brand Springs Hotel, he wrote to his wife Clementine that he was considering emigrating to Canada, as the opportunities were so great and he could, quote, make you and the kittens a little more comfortable before I die. Well, fortunately for the world, he did not emigrate here. However, returning to England, he spoke out against the government's plan to bring home rule to India. This was supported by the Conservative opposition, which resulted in Churchill losing his shadow cabinet position. Soon Mackenzie King joined him on the sidelines as he lost the general election held in July 1930. This was fortuitous as the Conservatives under R.B. Bennett had to deal with the Great Depression. King was back as Prime Minister in 1935, and the following year he was in Britain. He discussed the international situation with Churchill, who told him England was never in greater danger, and that inside of five years, it was possible that she would be a vassal state of Germany. Since 1932, Churchill had pleaded with the government and his fellow members of parliament to increase military expenditures to keep pace with those of Germany, but his efforts had fallen on deaf ears. The deaf ears also included those of Mackenzie King. He had built his early reputation as a labor negotiator, and from that position, there was a short step to the policy of appeasement. Thus, he was an enthusiastic supporter of the policy of the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain. King was in London in May 1937, and he met with the German ambassador to Britain, von Ribbentrop, there was a connection as Ribbentrop had worked in Ottawa prior to the First World War. Ribbentrop suggested that King should meet with Hitler. That was arranged that in June 1937, King presented himself at the Hindenburg Palace. King recorded the conversation in his diary, and it makes astonishing reading as Hitler went to great lengths to portray himself as a man of peace. Quoting from King's diary, Hitler went on to say, as far as war is concerned, you need have no fear of war at the instance of Germany. We have no desire for war, and we don't want war. Remember that I myself have been through a war. We know what a terrible thing war is, and not one of us wants to see another war. As we now know, Hitler was not being entirely dishonest. As long as he got what he wanted, there would be no war. King was obviously impressed and relieved by Hitler's statement. 
but to his credit, he did state that if Britain was attacked, Canada would come to Britain's aid. Whether that made any impression on Hitler is not evident, but it certainly made no impact on his future decisions. In March 1938, German troops marched into Austria. When that was happening, the British cabinet were entertaining Ribbentrop to lunch, and Churchill was surprised to have been invited. Ribbentrop was obviously well aware of Churchill's anti-Nazi speeches, and he remarked to Churchill, Don't forget, Mr. Churchill, if there is a war, we will have the Italians on our side. This elicited Churchill's response, recollecting the Italian army's less than stellar performance of World War I. My dear ambassador, it's only fair. We had them the last time. <laughs> Hitler's appetite then moved to Czechoslovakia. Even as late as 1938, records show that he could have been stopped. This was clear in a final directive that Hitler gave on June 18, 1938. I will decide to take action against Czechoslovakia only if I am firmly convinced that France will not march and that therefore England will not intervene. Three months later, in September 1938, with the tension mounting, Neville Chamberlain flew to Munich in Germany to meet with Hitler. The result was an ultimatum by Britain and France to the Czech government to allow Germany to take over the Sudetenland part of their country. In the debate on the agreement in the House of Commons, Churchill was almost alone in his denouncement of the deal. He started by saying, we have sustained a total and unmitigated defeat. Instead of snatching the victuals off the table, the German dictator has been content to have them served to him course by course. Then he made a prediction. You will find that in a period of time, which may be measured by years, but may be measured only by months, Czechoslovakia will be engulfed in the Nazi regime. This was borne out as in March 1939, just six months after the Munich Agreement, German troops marched into Prague and occupied the rest of Czechoslovakia. Germany invaded Poland on September the 1st, and once more Britain, which had guaranteed Poland security, was at war. Churchill was still a backbench MP, but in the debate in the House of Commons, he spoke. In the solemn hour, it is not a question of fighting for Danzig or fighting for Poland. We are fighting to save the world from the pestilence of Nazi tyranny and in defense of all that is sacred to man. Later that day, Chamberlain at last of the Churchill cabinet post his old position of First Lord of the Admiralty. Canada could have shielded itself behind the might and power of the United States, but it is to the credit of King and his government that they saw that they had an obligation to become involved again for the betterment in the long run of mankind. Also to King further credit for maneuvering the factions of his government, including ministers from Quebec, into a united group fully committed to Canada fighting the Britain's side. It is one thing to be at war and another to be able to wage war. Canada in September 1939 was totally unprepared. Mackenzie King's management of the country's finances had required balanced budgets and military expenditures were severely constrained. Now with war declared, he did a complete turnaround. A major expenditure was the British Commonwealth Air Training Programme, which was commenced in December 1939 to train in Canada pilots and aircrew from Britain, Canada, and other Commonwealth countries. This achieved spectacular results, as acknowledged by President Roosevelt in later referring to Canada as the aerodrome of democracy. 
Churchill soon became the voice of the British government. As he said, asking me not to make a speech is like asking a centipede to get along and not put a foot on the ground. <laughs> His radio broadcasts always finished on an optimistic note. As an example was one on January the 20th, 1940. Let the great cities of Warsaw, of Prague, of Vienna banish despair even in the midst of their agony. Their liberation is sure. The day will come when the joy bells will ring again throughout Europe and when victorious nations will plan and build in justice, in tradition and in freedom a house of many mansions where there will be room for all. In May 1940, a debate was held in the British House of Commons on the failed attempt at a landing at Narvik in northern Norway. While the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, should have been the one to take the blame, the debate turned into a critique of the government's handling of the war effort. The person in the centre was the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. He was subjected to intense criticism, not only from the opposition, but also from members of his own party. He had no choice other than to resign. He and King George wished his successor to be the Foreign Minister Lord Halifax. But Halifax declined, knowing that he was not the right man for the job. Thus really by default, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister. As Churchill wrote, at last I had the authority to give direction over the whole scene. I felt as if I were walking with destiny, and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. Mackenzie King telegraphed Churchill and assured him of the full support of Canada. However, both King and Churchill knew that to win the war, the United States had to join the Allies. But in the spring of 1940, President Roosevelt was far from convinced that Britain would survive. And he asked King to obtain an assurance from Churchill that if Britain was to surrender, then the fleet would be sailed to ports in the Western Hemisphere. Churchill responded to King that if the United States was in the war, then certainly they would ensure that the fleet was sailed to North America. But if the U.S. continued to be neutral, he could not tell what policy would be adopted by a pro-German administration. King passed on Churchill's response to Roosevelt, who considered it, quote, alarming and distressing. King was uncomfortable at being a linchpin between Churchill and Roosevelt, especially in view of the president's pessimistic attitude. And to bolster the beleaguered British Prime Minister, he made a radio broadcast on June the 7th, 1940. And this included, I speak the heart and mind of our country when I say that every fort in Canada will be another Calais and every harbour will be another Dunkirk before the men and women of our land allow the light and the life of their Christian faith to be extinguished by the powers of evil or yield their liberties to the tyranny of Nazi brutality. These weren't just words. This country was the lifeline keeping Britain alive. In the two years before the United States entered the war, Canada was providing 200 pounds of food per annum for every man, woman and child in Britain. A quotation from In the Footsteps of Churchill by respected the British historian Richard Holmes. In 1940-1941, Britain would not have survived had it not been for the agricultural, industrial, and financial aid received from Canada. While Churchill was using radio broadcasts to bolster the free world and the people who were suffering under the Nazis, Mackenzie King was also using media opportunities. On June the 1st, 1941, he broadcast to the people of Britain. We have been inspired by your bravery, your undaunted courage, and your determination to fight to the end. 
May I send to you, Mr. Churchill, warmest greetings and remembrances of what to me has been a valued friendship of many years. To us, you are the personification of Britain in this, a greatest hour. Churchill responded the next day to the people of Canada, and this included, Your comradeship in this mortal struggle cheers and fortifies the people of these islands. To Nazi tyrants and gangsters, it must seem strange that Canada, free from all compulsion or pressure, so many thousands of miles away, should hasten forward into the van of the battle against the evil forces of the world. The people of Great Britain are proud of the fact that the liberty of thought and action they have won through their long romantic history should have taken root throughout the length and breadth of a continent from Halifax to Victoria. Churchill was optimistic of the United States entering the war when President Roosevelt suggested that it would be beneficial if the two of them met face to face. This occurred in Placentia Bay, Newfoundland in August 1941. But Churchill soon realized that he was to be disappointed. Although the Atlantic Charter, which was signed, was a milestone in the history of the world. This became the template for the Declaration of the United Nations after the war. Later in the same month, August 1941, King flew to London and spoke at a luncheon in his honor by the Lord Mayor of London. He spoke of the courage of the British people and especially of the Londoners. Then he spoke directly to Churchill, who was present. By the power of your eloquence, by the energy of your conduct, and by the genius of your leadership, you have galvanized the great people into heroic action, rarely equaled and never excelled in the history of warfare. In December 1941, the United States was in the war, and Churchill arrived to discuss strategy. On December the 30th, he spoke in our House of Commons. This brought forth one of his best-known utterances. Referring to the French government when he was considering an armistice with Germany in May 1940, he stated, When I warned them that Britain would fight on alone, their generals told their prime minister and his divided cabinet, in three weeks, England will have a neck wrong like a chicken. Then Churchill commented, some chicken. And when the laughter of the, MP, the MPs died down, some neck. When Churchill left the House of Commons, he was photographed by Yusuf Kosh. And this became the Roaring Lion picture, one of the most famous photos in the annals of that medium. The background to this episode is detailed in the book. During Churchill's visit, Mackenzie King advised him that Canada would be giving Britain a gift of $1 billion for the purchase of food and military equipment. Upon his return to Britain, Churchill spoke of the gift in the House of Commons. I know the House will wish me to convey to the Government of Canada our lively appreciation of their timely and most generous offer. It is unequaled in its scale in the whole history of the British Empire, and it is convincing proof of the determination of Canada to make her maximum contribution towards the successful prosecution of the war. In this war, there were many tragedies. One of the most serious concerning Canada occurred on Boxing Day 1941, with the news that the garrison in Hong Kong have been overrun by the Japanese. As I wrote in the book, while the suffering of Canadian soldiers in this tragedy has not received the same attention as has that of the soldiers who participated in the Dieppe raid, it was as great, if not greater, and the loss was the result of equally stupid and disastrous decisions. Ten months before, in January 1941, Churchill had written to his chief of staff that there was not the slightest chance of holding Hong Kong and the garrison should be reduced to a symbolic number. This was not done and the Canadian government and military 
were unaware of Churchill's very specific statement when they agreed to the request to send two battalions comprising 2,000 soldiers to Hong Kong. The result was a massacre, with 550 of the Canadians killed or later died in prisoner of war camps. Eight months later, there was a raid on Dieppe, and I devote a whole chapter to this operation. There were many factors in the decision to launch the attack, many political and not military, and the due diligence which would have been expected was sadly not evident. The result was a further disaster. The final words in the chapter were left to Captain Peter Porteous, one of the three recipients of the Victoria, Victoria Cross. The people who planned it should be shot. However, the main person responsible, Lord Louis Mountbatten, was not shot. He was promoted soon afterwards. Mackenzie King was content to let Churchill and Roosevelt make the major war decisions, with Canada accepting whatever it was allotted. However, when Canada was not accorded recognition in communiques, on its part in the invasion of Sicily in 1943, it reacted with fury and corrections were made. Although the tide was turning in favor of the Allies, a formal conference between Churchill and Roosevelt was considered necessary. A request was made to Mackenzie King that the venue be in Quebec City, and this was readily offered with Canada covering the cost. Churchill found time at the conference to make a broadcast. He started by saying that President Roosevelt had suggested Quebec City for the conference. And Churchill said, quote, No more fitting and splendid setting could have been chosen. Here at the gateway of Canada, in mighty lands which have never known the totalitarian tyranny of Hitler and Mussolini, the spirit of freedom has found a safe and abiding home. The contribution which Canada has made to the combined effort of the British Commonwealth and Empire in these tremendous times has deeply touched the heart of the mother country. The major decision at that conference was that the invasion of France would be launched in the spring of 1944. What was named D-Day occurred on, January, on June the 6th with the largest seaborne invasion of his, in history. Of the five beaches stalled, Canada was allotted Juno Beach. 120 Canadian warships were involved, and 14,000 Canadians were landed and established the beachhead within two hours. Churchill had advised King George that he intended to watch the landings from one of the cruiser squadrons. The King was highly against the Prime Minister putting himself in danger, so he said he would come too. Churchill responded that the king couldn't do that. After many messages back and forth, Churchill agreed not to embark. As the king's private secretary wrote, we have bested him, which not many people have succeeded in doing in the past four years. The DD invasion was a success, although progress was slow, and Churchill and Roosevelt decided that another conference in Quebec City was necessary. And this occurred in September 1944. Churchill was in ill health when he boarded the Queen Mary and was obliged to take malaria pills, which upset his constitution. However, as recorded by the British High Commissioner to Canada, Malcolm MacDonald, then he set foot on Canadian earth and was given a wild sing-song reception from Canadian crowds. All the harm that the sulfur drugs had done disappeared, and all the good they had done remained. He was at once in his most friendly and glorious mood, and remained so throughout the conference. Although in late 1944 the war was winding down, Mackenzie King was forced to bring in legislation to impose conscription for overseas service, which was strongly opposed in the province of Quebec. A major reason why I wrote this book was to set out the enormous sacrifice made by Canada in the war, in human lives, but also in huge financial expenditures. 
All Canadians, and especially the younger generation, should know that the standard of living and the freedom we enjoy owe much to the courage and commitment of this prior generation. Out of a population of 11 million, more than 1 million voluntarily enlisted, 47,000 were killed and 58,000 were wounded. The total expenditure in dollar terms was $18 billion. By the end of the war, Britain had received almost $3.5 billion in gifts and loans from Canada, which were used for munitions and goods. In addition, Canada also provided a $1.2 billion loan in 1946 at a nominal interest rate of 2% to the bankrupt Britain. Much has been made of the monetary assistance given by the United States to Britain, but on a per capita basis, Canada gave over three times as much. At the end of the European War, elections were held in Canada and Britain. In Canada, the Conservative Opposition's campaign concentrated on denigrating King's Liberal Party's handling of the war effort. Whereas King ran a positive campaign including announcing the new baby bonus, and he won a landslide victory. In Britain, Churchill, although he was a national hero, ran a negative campaign which included comparing the socialists to Nazis. The Socialist Labour Party promoted a vision of a better life for the citizens, and they won a clear victory. King complained of tiredness and had considered retirement. But in view of the election victory, he continued in office. The Mackenzie Diaries give a unique insight into major events concerning he and Churchill. But there are also personal matters in their discussions which show the depth of their relationship. These include King telling Churchill of his practice of spiritualism, and he wrote that Churchill was quite reverent in his attitude to this disclosure. And Churchill, although claiming to be a non-believer, telling King that when he died, he would have to account to God for the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. That God would ask him why he had done this, and he would reply, he had seen the terrors of war, his conscience told him that he had done what was best for mankind. In November 1947, King was in Britain for the marriage of Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip. He dined with Churchill, and by this time, his attitude had become one of almost hero worship. He wrote, I confess that as I looked at him across the table, I felt that perhaps, in more respects than one, he was the greatest man of our times. King, his health deteriorating, retired in the summer of 1948 after 21 years as Prime Minister. This was and still is a record for longevity of a Prime Minister in all of British and Commonwealth history. At his final Commonwealth Conference in London in October 1948, at the advice of his doctors, he had to take to his bed at the Dorchester Hotel. A stream of well-wishers visited him there, including King George, and of course, Winston Churchill. They had known each other for almost 50 years, and this would be their final meeting. How has history treated these two men? Each year, some 20 books are published on aspects of Churchill's life. On King, there have been very few books. Churchill has been a magnet to writers as the great champion of freedom. King did not have the same appeal, and when his diaries became public, his practice of his spiritualism made him the subject of ridicule. However, as Charlotte Gray wrote in Mrs. King, a biography of his mother published in 1997, most recently his stock has risen with dizzying speed as his skill in papering over the fractures within Canadian society is recognized. In a BBC poll conducted in 2002, the greatest Briton of all time was judged to be Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill. He 
In 1997, Maclean's magazine queried 26 academics, historians, and political scientists as to the greatest Canadian Prime Minister. They judged him to be William Lyon Mackenzie King. Thank you. Over to you. Comments, disagreements, questions, whatever. How long is your book? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, but your second, sir. Yes. How was your book received in Britain? My brother bought three copies. <laughs> <laughs> I, they wouldn't. It was in hardback initially, originally. The first print was hardback. And the Churchill War Rooms wouldn't take copies in hardback. They said no one buys hardback books in Britain anymore. But it came out in paperback. It, uh, they took uh, some. And I, I was over there a couple of years ago. and quite a privilege to actually sign five copies that I had there at the time. So it won't, it won't be a big seller in Britain, of course. No, it's, it's geared to the uh, Canadian audience. So. Uh, I believe that the uh, discussions between Churchill and Roosevelt at the Quebec uh, uh, excluded Mackenzie King from them because the word that I read somewhere was that Mackenzie King couldn't keep a secret. And the security services basically said, don't tell him anything important. What's your I haven't heard that one, one but uh, I'll give you my version of it, which uh, initially when it was going to be in, they asked, we like the conference in Quebec City, and we came to the Inc. City, well, the three of us, they said, no, two of you. It's just the two of Roosevelt and Churchill. And they said, well, Roosevelt said, if we, if, we, if we invite you, then we've got to invite all the leaders of all the other allies. So Churchill, uh, so Mackenzie King, he was brilliant at working things out in his brain. So he thought, I'll be in all the photo sessions so the people of Canada will think I'm in the conference. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, and he was right. All the photo sessions, he's in the hall. So if you don't know it anymore, you think he's involved. So, so that was there. But uh, it was. It got testy initially about whether or not uh, he should be involved. But it didn't last too long. He worked it out himself. And quite honestly, he didn't want to be involved in it. He knew that he was not. He didn't have the the background in military at all, which. Roosevelt and Churchill did. They were both under. They were both secretaries. Roosevelt was secretary, under secretary of the Navy in the First World War, and Church, Churchill was the first one of the Admiralty. They didn't know as much about military affairs as they thought they did, but at least they do. They knew more than the Kennedy case. So, thank you. Sir, hmm. you mentioned that famous photograph that Yusuf Karsh took yes. of Churchill. I, I lived in Ottawa at that time and was well known there, they asked uh, Karsh how did he get that particularly pugnacious look on Churchill's face, and he said, very simple, Churchill had a cigar in his mouth, and I didn't want to take the picture with a cigar, so I took the cigar out of his mouth and then snapped the picture yeah. when Churchill gave the reaction to losing his cigar. Exactly. <laughs> you must have read my book. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it's interesting though, um, later, Clementine Churchill, Winston's wife, was talking to, this was later in the war, talking to Mackenzie King, and she said, um, I don't like the photograph, and neither does Winston. He has a much, she said, he has a much nicer expression in his face than he was shown in that. <laughs> no one wants to talk about Dieppe. People always bring it up to you, and uh, it's, uh, next year is the 75th anniversary. Good. <laughs> okay, sir. Um, could you comment on the controversy about uh, whether it was um, a good idea for Canada to send the two battalions to Hong Kong into what was obviously a hopeless situation? 
Well, I did, I did mention that. It was, they didn't think it was hopeless at the time. They didn't know enough about it. But it didn't take a lot of uh, military expertise to, to see the forces that Japan could bring forward to it and the indefensible position that uh, Canada and Canadian troops were in. It, uh, it, it's one of those things in, in the war. But even in the First World War, there were even worse decisions made, but that was a that was a tragic one for Canada. Oh, so in the case of Dieppe, though, um, although as I understand it, the original intent wasn't to learn lessons about landing there. The lessons they did learn there, I understand, were applied with great success ultimately in Normandy and in Juneau in particular. That's the, one of the two official reasons, but the fact is that uh, most historians say common sense would tell you what they learned from landing. You don't land on a gravel beach unless you know exactly what, how you can get over it. They didn't know there was gravel there, but they didn't. They thought they could just go, the Germans had put barricades across and everything. The other one was to take pressure off the Russians on the Eastern Front. They were the two ones. Now, I, often when I'm speaking, People bring up these um, David O'Keefe's David O'Keefe book about one day in August, um, which he comes out with a completely different uh, viewpoint on that. And um, he's not found any historian that I know of who supports him. In it. His point was that the, the Bletchley Park, the, the code-breaking people at Bletchley Park in England, in, in England, they were able to break the German code when it was a three rotor Enigma machine. But then the nasty Nazis brought in a four rotor machine and they couldn't break it. And so O'Keefe's book was purely based upon they were trying to get a four rotor machine. I, I actually reviewed the book for the finest hour of the Churchill Center magazine in the US. And I read it twice just to make sure he doesn't say exactly how one, you were going to get this to the ships on the beach. These are very hefty things. Plus also, how are the Germans not going to know you've done this? I don't see that anywhere in the book. And uh, but he's done quite well, I think, selling his book. He copies some. <laughs> Lloyd, you had a question. So, I was going to ask, uh, why do you think, Terry, that uh, Mackenzie King's reputation down through the generations in this country has stood to be perhaps worthy, but dull and uninspired. Exactly. He, do, he didn't have the personality. Mackenzie King, from his early years, thought he and God were walking hand in hand. And he didn't like anything what he called, we call charisma, he called self-aggrandizement. Because God wouldn't like that. So he never, he acted, he acted in this uh, like Uriah Heap sort of thing. I know my place. Even as quite late in the war, where as uh, President Roosevelt was calling in Mackenzie, he was calling Mr. President. Eventually Roosevelt said, no, you're, you're even, you're older than I am. And so he said, oh, okay, Franklin, big stuff. It's, it's, it's a bit cringy, this is. But if you want to see real cringing stuff, because you can see, you can read Mackenzie King's diary online from Lyman Archives Canada. You go through the part where he got in, he was engaged to be married. He was 25, I think, years of age. He was he was supposed to marry a nurse from Chicago. He's going back and forward. She loves me. She, it's it's cringeworthy. I say in the book, it would it would have brought a blush to the cheek of a Hollywood romance editor. <laughs> it was terrible, and that was. That was, he was very careful. She wasn't as good as his mother, so that was it. <laughs> With respect to Hong Kong, what we heard at the time uh, was that they, they sent their heavy equipment on a different ship which never arrived. Yeah. Have you come across that? But not specifically, but they were, they were trained actually on the ship going over there, which is not you know, and, and the Japanese troops, of course, had been fighting in Manchuria, 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 and they were they were fully trained, and we had on on training. Yes. Well, so, 
So, uh, I'm just wondering if your your book uh, says anything about the relationship between King and Beaverbrook. There was a relationship, and what impact that might have had on King's dealings with Churchill. No, I didn't have a lot. I do have. Um, I think uh, I do have in 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 the part on Dieppe, where Beaverbrook sees Mountbatten at a dinner and says, you murdered my people, in full sound of everyone there. Uh, the forward is by John Turner, and uh, he, talk, he talks about Beaver Book in his forward. But no, I didn't do that. It was mainly about these two, so you can only go so far. This has been another in the ongoing series of podcasts brought to you as an educational service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. You can keep abreast of our web offerings as well as our live events by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. Once again, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for being with us and good night.